may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. We have officially begun Holy Week, the most significant week of the church calendar. Everything, everything culminates with this week. Everything the scriptures have anticipated since creation. It addresses the fundamental matter of how the God of all things relates to us and the created order. Lent has given us the space to see how such a God relates to us in our own sinful depths. And Holy Week is the ultimate response to such deaths. It's the wondrous announcement that our God actually plummeted to our deaths. And it begins today. Palm Sunday is such a mixture of emotions. Going from this celebratory procession of welcoming our King to the demands that He be crucified. As I wrote in the dispatch, this pairs with what the Christian life really looks like. We are a people who sing heartfelt praise and adoration to God, and yet in the same week, sitting against Him, loving all the wrong things again. Yet we behold this week how the cross, the very death that we demanded for our Messiah, is the means by which the grace of our God meets us in our complicated, sinful hearts. This is why the passion narrative from the Gospel is so epic. And what's happening reveals way more than what we hear on the surface. This is why Jesus keeps setting his sights toward Jerusalem. Um, in the Gospels, he takes that break, he sets his eyes towards Jerusalem, and it was not for his deserved Hosanna prays, but to receive the death we deserve. So this morning I want to make three observations from the Passion narrative, which speaks into the significance of this week and what it means for us now. Well, the first observation prepares us for Monday, Thursday. As much as some of the disciples are willing to put up a fight um, with their swords, the betrayal and arrest of Jesus entails all of his disciples deserting him and scattering away in fear. In Matthew's account, Jesus reveals this arrest to be one of fulfillment of the scriptures. Matthew's gospel is known for their, his Old Testament fulfillments, and you can also hear such echoes from, um, from the prophet Isaiah we heard this morning. It read, he was oppressed, and he was afflicted, and he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. The betrayal and scattering of the disciples remind me of the Psalms. When the psalmist experiences that such betrayal from a friend, he says he can handle the attack from an enemy, but a friend coming from behind with a stab in the back type of scenario carries a particular sharpness. And perhaps that's something you can relate to, too. People you trusted, and yet turned against you in harmful ways. If for Jesus, he anticipated such blows. He knew they were coming. Didn't change the sharpness but he knew it was there. Despite Peter's determination to never deny Jesus, even to, to die for him, he said, Jesus says, you will in fact deny me three times. And he totally anticipates Judas's betrayal, which the gospel writers seem to always mention whenever Judas is named. Judas, the one who betrays Jesus. Their denial, betrayal, and deserting of Jesus cuts deeper, considering how close they were with him. I mean, these guys dropped their livelihoods. They left their jobs, their families, 
and walked with Jesus for nearly three years. They witnessed countless miracles and healings where the blind could see, the lame could walk, thousands of people fed, people released from the demonic, and even last week where the dead were raised. And for good measure, before they scattered, Jesus even heals their enemies. Again, this reveals the complexity of Palm Sunday with the life of a disciple of Jesus, as one who seeks to follow Jesus. We have our moments of drop everything and follow him, paired with our scattered affections, where we abandon him and choose fear instead. However, the good news of the gospel is that Jesus isn't surprised by these things. He anticipates them, actually. He called Judas and Peter and the rest of them fully knowing they would betray, deny, and desert him. He did the same for you. This is because Jesus doesn't call the righteous. He calls sinners. And these are the ones, as the prophet says, he intercedes and advocates for such grace and favor are given to always deepen our repentance. For the disciples, we see how Peter caught such grace, and he wept bitterly amidst his own denial. However, Judas could not handle or imagine grace for himself, and it led to his own death. The advocacy for the guilty and intercession for the sinner really leads to my second observation of the Passion. And this second observation prepares us for Good Friday. Now before the crowds, namely us by the way, you all did a fine job being the crowds, good job. Before these crowds demand our Lord's crucifixion, they desire the murderous insurrectionist Barabbas to be released and Jesus be put to death. This is by far an outrageous decision by the people and what would be entirely unfair to our system of justice. Jesus is clearly innocent. But on top of being falsely accused and charged, a man who is rightly found guilty is cleared and released when Jesus takes his place. In Mel Gibson's uh, The Passion of the Christ, we visually see Barabbas, Uh, being released from his chains. They're choking him with these chains, and he's a wild man, actually. He's a crazy man. Um, And and Barabbas looks exactly what I would anticipate him to look like. He's got, like, um, a a messy beard and and really uh, gritty teeth, and and he's uh, leering at the soldiers, and he's like an animal is what he looks like. And he can't believe people are chanting his name. It's like, oh, I'm getting attention, right? And so um, there's this moment, however, this very brief moment, where when the decision is made and as he's being released from his chains, he looks at Jesus. And, and when released, he knows just a tiny moment that fundamentally that this shouldn't be happening. Um, but then he reverts back to his crazy Barabbas self. It's like, yeah, he's getting crucified, I know, I should be there, but, but I'm getting free. And he acts wild. And as offensive as it is it to see, which it's wild to see visually, by the way, what's clearly being revealed is the offensive nature of grace. What we see happening between Jesus and Barabbas is a visual display of what's even more profound and startling in what the Reformers called the great or beautiful exchange in the cross of Christ. It's exactly what Isaiah prophesied when he said, Out of the anguish of his soul he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. In such an exchange, the righteous one bears our iniquities, and in bearing them, he accounts us righteous. We do not only go free like Barabbas, the prophet tells us, 
but were regarded righteous or fulfillers of the law. And this is remarkable news because we live in such a performance-driven world. The cross puts away all forms of measurement, and any performance anxiety we have can be calmed with the finishing work of Christ, his merits. That the weighing of merits has been put away, and there is only pardon for our offenses. So friends, we are not regarded righteous because there was something inherently righteous about you. We're regarded righteous because there isn't. It is a righteousness that is not our own, yet becomes our own, and it's regarded to be our own. And there are really two divine realities we now share in through the cross. We are always, first of all, relieved from any notions of performance or merit in relationship with Almighty God. That's put away. And secondly, our righteous status opens such newness of life in relationship to Him. And this is my final observation of the Passion and what actually prepares us for the Easter Vigil. As Jesus dies upon the tree, cries out with a loud voice, and breathed his last. Matthew tells us that at that moment, at the moment where he draws his last breath and his heart stops beating, the curtain of the temple was torn from top to bottom. Now, the temple, as you might know, was understood as the place where God's presence dwelled. There was a keen sense of God's holiness within the temple. And therefore, a distinction was made between his sinful creatures and his holiness with the use of a curtain. It was a physical sign of a spiritual barrier between us and God. It reflected Mount Sinai where the presence of God was manifested through smoke and fire surrounding the mountain. One touch would drop you dead. Even when Moses came down the mountain, his complexion changed, and the people were rightly terrified and in fear. Because a sinful and corrupted people could not stand before the presence and holiness and otherness of Almighty God. Again, this curtain uh, signified such a separation. It was between the holy place and the most holy place. It was like two levels of VIP exclusivity, okay? Now what's remarkable is the size of this curtain. It was an elaborately woven fabric of 72 twisted plates of 24 threads each. It was 60 feet high and 30 feet wide. No one was allowed to enter the most holy place behind the curtain except the high priest. And it only entered once a year on the Day of Atonement. As Jesus breathed his last, he made there our complete atonement. His one oblation of himself once offered a full, perfect, and sufficient sacrifice, oblation and satisfaction for the sins of the whole world. Does that sound familiar? Does that sound familiar? Amen. That the split of the curtain from top to bottom meant it was God who made such a cup. His incarnate flesh plummeted down all the intricate fabrics of division. It was his divine act and his alone. Again, the prophet saw it coming down when he said, He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. The ripping of the curtain was the ripping of Christ's flesh, where we who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. We can now enter 
such presence fully and completely reconciled to the Father by the Son's atonement in the power of the Holy Spirit. We can come boldly, the book of Hebrews tells us, before such throne of grace without fear or shame, but to rejoice to behold His appearing. We can have a present and active relationship with our God in such a way that His gracious and character of mercy can be revealed throughout the world. I want to close these observations with Paul's exhortation, which leads him to what's commonly called the Christ hymn. It comes from Philippians. He says, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. I love that phrase. I love that line. Paul does this later on in his letter. Again, the same kind of language. Have this, which is already yours. He does this again and says, not that I have already obtained this. He goes on to say, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. In other words, we pursue the humility of Christ to have this be our chief perspective <clears throat> because it already belongs to us. It's already been given to us. It's already reckoned to us, accounted to us. This is the kind of relationship God seeks with us, one that participates in the life of Christ and his mission in the world, not because we need to achieve something, but because this is the reality God has already established with you through the cross. Pursue the mind of Christ. Empty yourself before God, even to the death of yourself, and see the glory of God for every name to confess Christ and every knee to bend before Him. So I think it's appropriate that we even start now with the bending of our own knees to humble ourselves before God, to confess our sins before Him, and to know that such absolution is free, freely given, freely offered. And may we come before his table with hungry hearts to know that he feeds us and leads us down this holy week to an empty tomb. Amen.